This is the second video for section 2.1, The Sky Above, from OpenStax Astronomy Chapter 2. And so we're picking back up right where we left off the first lecture video from this section. So we had seen this um, picture of star trails from Hawaii, and we had talked about the fact that the central object in um, all of these different circles, the bright and shortest arc is the North Star Polaris, and in the true center of all of these circles is the sky point, the North Celestial Pole. So I want to draw this out for us briefly to point out some key things here. When we look at that um, star, and we're going to write out Polaris here, and we're going to write that NCP, North Celestial Pole, is roughly at that same spot. We're going to call those as, as almost interchangeable because from this real picture, we can see that they are very close together. Now, the key thing here is when we look directly below where Polaris is, that is where our compass north is. And if we are facing north, then to our right is east. And to our left, a little bit off the picture here, would be west. Now, I want to go through a couple of things because this picture here doesn't really show the motion, it just shows the overall change in position. There's a couple of key things that I want to go through here. First of all, when we think about these stars moving, we need to remember that the reason that they are moving is simply because this, um, the Earth itself is rotating, is spinning every single day. Stars rise and set or go around in big circles, like some of the ones near um, Polaris in the picture here. We can see the whole circle. But stars move because the Earth is rotating. The sun rises and sets every single day because the Earth is rotating. We can use our relatively good understanding of where the sun rises and sets uh, that's something that we're more aware of, either from previous classes or just being aware of the sun um, at sunrise and sunset. Something that we should have as a fact in our brains, and if we don't, that's fine, just put it all caps in our notebook. The sun rises in the east every morning, and it sets in the west every morning. What that means, then, is stars also rise in the east. So we can draw stars rising, arrows going upwards, when we are talking about the eastern direction. And if we were talking about stuff in the west, it would be coming back down instead. What that means then is as we get closer to Polaris, the stars rising in the east are going up and around Polaris, and the stars setting in the west are coming down and around Polaris. And we get overall circular motion around um, the North Star that looks like it's in this counterclockwise direction. I don't want us to memorize this idea of counterclockwise, though, because that's only true when we're looking north. If instead we imagine the kind of other part of this um, picture here, that we're facing south. To our right, if we're facing south, is west. And to our left, facing um, south, to our left would be east. Now again, we want to use not the idea of clockwise and counterclockwise. Memorizing that as a fact is going to get lost in our heads and it'll be a coin flip by the time we have to use it on an assignment or a quiz or anything like that. But we do have this better understanding, these key fundamental facts, that the sun rises in the east, so it goes up in the east, and the sun sets in the west, it goes down in the west. What that means then is when we are facing south, we don't see the north star. We see these big motions up and over, kind of like a rainbow pattern. And all of this is making big circles around the South Celestial Pole, but the South Celestial Pole is below our horizon. There is a term here that we can use to describe how high above the horizon the North Star is, and that term is the altitude. Now the altitude is the height um, as an angle above the horizon. 
we are using this in a very specific astronomy context. It is not like climbing a mountain kind of altitude. But zero degrees altitude means we are on the horizon. Positive 90 degrees means we're directly up. We have a term for that. We might remember that from the previous video. It's the zenith. So zenith, or directly up. And negative 90 degrees means nadir. Not an, a term that's important to us, but directly down. And this helps us understand something else important here. When we are talking about directions on the sky, we can talk about north, east, south, and west. We can also talk about up and down. To see the north star, you have to face north and you have to look about halfway up um, for us here in Grand Rapids. That particular height is based on our location. That is really important to us. We have words that we, um, we've already written altitude, but latitude is a word that isn't necessarily new to this, um, to this semester. That's something that we would have learned in um, middle school or high school. Latitude and longitude are the way that we describe locations on the globe. So latitude is how far above or below the equator that we are. So the equator is at zero degrees latitude. And there's a really key and useful thing about the location of Polaris to help us figure out what latitude we're actually at on the globe. The height above the horizon, the altitude that we see Polaris, is the same number value as the latitude where we are currently standing. So for Grand Rapids, if we're at 43 degrees north latitude, then Polaris is going to be 43 degrees up above the horizon. 43 is really close to halfway between 0 and 90, so it's a pretty good rule of thumb that if you're in the continental United States, the North Star is about halfway up in your sky. So that's something that's worth keeping in mind. This picture would be worth drawing out if you haven't already. We'll be seeing more of these different um, pictures drawn on our uh, whiteboard throughout this uh, lecture. Now, I want us, if you need to, you can always rewind the video to, to look at that drawing that I made of the um, star in the sky, Polaris, and circles around it. I want us to think about what that would look like if we lived at Earth's North Pole and if we lived at the equator. I want you to pause the video and think about it, and probably what you really should do is draw it out. I'm not there to look over your shoulder, but you really should draw it out, and then we'll talk through what those differences look like. So pause your video. Okay. So, if we go back to a nice empty whiteboard, we can think about Earth's North Pole. So at the North Pole, this is going to be the full dome view. If we are looking in a single direction, we can kind of see to either side of us, forward, and all the way up to the top. The North Pole, by definition on Earth, is at 90 degrees north latitude. If we didn't remember that, that's okay, and maybe you can pause the video now to try to think about what that would look like if you were kind of on the wrong track to begin with. But if we're at 90 degrees north latitude, that means that the North Star is 90 degrees above the horizon. We talked about what that point is called. It is going to be at zenith. And everything is going to look like it is going around it in these big circle motions around it. And in fact, at the North Pole, nothing actually rises and sets. All of the stars just kind of rotate um, in big circular motions around and around. And technically at the North Pole, every direction that you look is south, and so every single direction has to be equivalent or symmetric, um, if, you, if you did think about it that way. Okay, at the equator instead, So the Earth's equator, by definition, is at zero degrees latitude. It is the difference between north numbers and south numbers, so it is at zero, which means that it is zero degrees away from the horizon. 
it is on the horizon or at the horizon. So again, if we are facing north, then the North Star would be right at the horizon, right at the horizon. Stuff rises in the east, right? And sets, I wrote S, but I meant W for west, and sets in the west. And so we have these big motions up and over um, for all of this. Um, if stuff is rising in the east and setting in the west, we still have these big overall motions, just like we did before. And so when we are thinking about uh, these, um, these different pictures here, we can kind of think about if we imagine taking this higher and higher, we're transi transitioning to eventually get to the North Pole, where the most extreme, we're kind of looking upwards to see those counterclockwise motions. The textbook has this picture here, um, which is very useful when we're thinking about the three-dimensional nature of this. But we do want to be able to translate from this three-dimensional view to um, this, what you would look like if you were facing a direction on the ground view, the observer-centered um, view. Okay, so that's something to be aware of as well. You can always pause the video or rewind but you should be drawing any pictures that I draw, you should probably also be drawing in your notes to look back at. Okay, the other important thing to know is that if you are struggling with picturing these different motions, you are not alone. This is one of the toughest topics that students um, deal with, not because of necessarily the complex science involved, but because of the really complex visualization that our brains have to do thinking about all of these different motions. It is really difficult, and for a lot of us, we don't have that skill from a previous class, that we're, uh, and we're building it from scratch. So I strongly suggest that, as needed, you spend time using the Rotating Sky Explorer. The link is here. Uh, you can um, search it online, and it is worth noting it's an older um, program or website, and so it doesn't work in all browsers, but if it does work, it is really useful to play around with and, and mess around with. And so I'll try to um, show us what that looks like um, outside of this lecture format. Okay. So a couple of questions for us to think about, uh, to see if this stuff is uh, sinking in or not. And if it's not, it's not a problem. We have a chance to work with these different um, ideas outside of the original lecture and trying them in different activities. But let's say that we see a star that is rising when we look perfectly in the eastern direction. So it's rising due east, perfectly right between uh, north and south. When this star reaches its highest position above the horizon, where is it going to be? So pause the video and think through these answers. Okay. Um, if you answer too quickly, or if you didn't draw anything or look back at your notes, then you probably guessed answer five here, directly overhead. It's a common misconception, and it's wrong, but it's often because we're not actually using these new tools and um, visualization skills that we're building. What we do want to start to recognize, when we are drawing things, Drawing things out is part of the critical thinking process. We never want to see this multiple choice question and decide that we either know it or we don't, and we either have that knowledge or we don't. That's not how these work. We want to try to think through how we can use our underlying skills that we're building and facts that we remember and knowledge that we have to answer this new, different question. Okay. So if we are facing east, then north is to our left, and maybe we remember that that means that the stars are going around in big circles, and south is to our right, and maybe we remember that the um, stars are going um, kind of in big arcs from east over to west. But what that means is in the east, stuff can't go straight up and down because then it would never get into the southern sky at all. And it can't go towards the north because stuff is going around the, the, um, 
North Star here. This is kind of a mess, all these different um, pic pictures, uh, all these different arrows. But the key thing here that I want us to recognize is that when stars rise, they rise at an angle. That angle is based on where you, uh, where you live on Earth. On the equator, and only on the equator, stuff goes directly overhead. Um, it, uh, not, not even directly overhead, but it goes directly up, which means that some stuff goes into the northern sky and some stuff goes into the southern sky. But for the entire continental United States, stuff rises at a slant towards the southern sky. This star, when it reaches its highest position above the horizon, will go into the southern sky. If it helps, in the room where you're um, going through all of these different, um, I'm going to leave this up, where you're going through all of these different slides and lecture videos, mark out which direction is north. And if you don't know, just make one up, north, east, south, and west, and physically visualize it and point at things and kind of have stuff go through the sky and like point at it. That is critical thinking. It is using what we have available to us to help train our brain to understand what's going on. We're not trying to memorize words on a page. That means we don't necessarily understand those words. So the answer here is three, high in the southern sky. It has to get up high in the southern sky. What that also means, and it's worth taking note of, is that all throughout the year, when it is roughly noon, the sun is in the southern sky. It is never in the north. And something that we will talk about in chapter four, in the continental United States, the sun is never, ever directly overhead. That is also a common misconception, but we'll save that conversation for chapter four. A new question for us, though. Let's imagine that we are camping in a field outside Grand Rapids, Michigan. Looking directly north, we see a star just barely above the horizon. About 15 minutes later, we notice that it has shifted position slightly. Which way did it move? So pause the video and think through it. All right. Now the reason I kept this up behind me is because we actually have the answer um, here for us. Look. This little star here is just barely above the northern horizon. And when we first notice it 15 minutes later, it's basically going directly to the right. If we look at our north, east, south, and remember that this picture would then kind of have west on the, um, behind our head. For this star that we're talking about, that's perfectly north, it's about to move eastwards on its way up and around the North Star, which means that the answer here is option one. It moves to the right in that short amount of time. It will eventually go up, but right now it is not going up. It is just going sideways. And again, we never want to see this kind of question and just hope that the answer is in our brains and leaps out. We always want to think through it critically, and often that involves drawing some kind of quick sketch or finding some kind of diagram to help us um, think about the answer there. Okay. So, the last term that was in our nice list of celestial sphere terms to add to our vocabulary was the ecliptic. Now, uh, in kind of a um, cut between different topics, do you know your astrological sign? I'm uh, in the star sign Taurus, and astrology, it is worth making sure we understand, astrology has its roots in astronomy. They formed at roughly the same time, and we will be talking about that history in section 2.2, and the book goes into astrology a little bit more in section 2.3. What is incredibly important for us to understand, though, is astrology is a belief system. It is not a science. And in a lot of ways, it acts as a pseudoscience. What that means is it pretends to use the scientific method. But when we come up with any test, and the textbook talks about several of them, those tests disprove the ideas of astrology but astrology does not throw them out the way a science needs to. 
There is nothing wrong with astrology as a belief system, but we are taking a science class and we are not going to get into the belief system of astrology. We are in an astronomy class. That is the science class behind it. But the six, not six, <laughs> the 12 star signs that are on our slide here, the ones that are kind of familiar with if you've ever thought about horoscopes or anything like this, they actually do have a specific meaning in astronomy. They are the only constellations, with the exception of one extra one called Ophiuchus. It's in the bottom of this picture here. They are the only constellations that it seems like the sun travels through over the course of the year. Now, all of this is based on perspective. Right now, if I hold um, my whiteboard eraser in front of my eyes, from your point of view, the eraser seems like it's in the same direction as my face, right? It's not in the same direction as my hand, it is in the same direction as my face. With the sun, when we are on Earth and looking in the direction of the sun, there are stars in that same direction. That's what astrology originally used to decide the different times of year what star sign would go with each one. The problem is, in modern times, those dates no longer line up properly with where the sun is. We will talk about that a little bit in section 2.2. The fact that when this was set up, it was in ancient Babylon. And since then, we've learned about a process called precession that has caused the whole earth to kind of rotate around all of the places that it um, kind of points at. The North Celestial Pole no longer always points at the same spot. We'll talk about that in section 2.2. But what this means for us, connecting to astrology, the sun appears to be in different constellations throughout the year, but we can't see stars during the day. The reason why this matters to us is because if we're looking opposite the sun, then we are seeing those stars high in the southern sky at nighttime. So in this picture, for example, we have, um, we have in June it looks like the sun is in the direction of Taurus. Now my birthday is at the end of April, and so this is telling me right away that our actual star signs um, don't line up with kind of standard astrology dates. But in June, I would not be able to see Taurus in the sky because it would be blocked out by the sun. It would be up during the day, it would rise with the sun and set with the sun. But at nighttime, I would see the constellation Scorpius quite high in the nighttime sky. It would be highest at midnight because it's exactly opposite the sun, and it would be rising around sunset, kind of when the sun goes away, it comes into view, and then the same um, would be true when it is setting, it's because the sun is rising. If we wait a couple of months, we go from Taurus to Gemini to Cancer, in August, there are now different constellations directly behind the sun, and at nighttime, Sagittarius and Capricorn are the ones that rise at sunset, are high at midnight, and then set at, um, at sunrise. So our constellations throughout the year change. We will be exploring this in um, activities outside of the lecture, uh, but it's something that's worth being aware of. The reason why we're bringing all of this up when we're introducing the term ecliptic is because the path that the sun appears to take through our sky, the kind of red line here, that is one way of describing the ecliptic. When we think about um, stars then, um, let me go back a slide. When we think about stars then rising and setting, on a daily basis, the reason everything is moving, the sun and the stars and everything, the, the daily motion is causing everything to rise in the east and set in the west. And the sun and the stars move almost the same exact way. There is, however, a four minute difference with the sun rising and setting and stars rising and setting. And that's because not only is this earth rotating once every single day, but it is also going around the sun once every year, which means every single time it spins, it's 
one 365th forward along its path. And so our perspective of the stars um, behind the sun and the stars in the opposite direction in our nighttime sky changes slightly. What that means is constellations rise and set at different times when we start to look at different um, points in the year. So I want us to think about, and it may be involve uh, drawing some things out, I want us to think about how that change might actually play out then. So pause and think question for us, and this one's a little bit tougher um, than the others compared to what information we have yet to present. Well, let's say we go out tonight and we see the star Rigel barely rising above our eastern horizon at 10 p.m. What will be true about the same star, Rigel, one week later? So pause the video, read through the question and the options, and then we'll go through the answer. Okay. Now hopefully when you were thinking about this, you narrowed it down a bit. Hopefully when you read through those different questions, um, you ruled out setting on your western horizon. If it's rising in the east and it's only a week different, it's not going to be on the other side of the sky, right? That would be a difference of six months, half a year, not a, not a week. So four we cross out, we get rid of. Since we've just introduced the topic that the sun and the stars do have small differences on a day-to-day -day basis, we should probably have comfortably ruled out option two as well. It cannot be at the exact same um, place because then there's no way for changes to happen on a month-to-month -month basis if we aren't able to have changes on a day-to-day -day basis, small ones that add up over time. So really our option should have been one, that it's a little bit higher than it was before, and three, that it's a little bit lower than it was before. The answer is in fact one, that it is slightly higher in the sky, and it will take us some activities and external resources and drawing things out to really understand why stars rise a little bit earlier and earlier each day. But for now, we can acknowledge that hopefully critical thinking narrowed down our choices to options one and three. It's okay if it didn't, we're still working this out. But the answer here is option one, that it's a little bit higher because it rose a little bit earlier in time and has had more time to move through our sky. Now the ecliptic is tilted with respect to the celestial equator because the earth itself is tilted as it goes around the sun. So when we talk about the ecliptic, there are really two ways that we can define it. It is the path that the sun appears to make through our sky, and that would be the dashed line, not dashed line, the red line in our slide here. We see the sun has a little um, sun point at March, December, September, June, um, and all throughout the year, it's somewhere along that red line. But the other way that we can describe the ecliptic is the path that the Earth takes through the solar system. Because that plane, the, the motion that we're making around the sun, is the reason why we see that different perspective from each of those different locations. The ecliptic and the celestial equator do cross at two different points on March 21st and September 21st. And we will talk about those special dates in our calendar in chapter four. So, this ends our discussion in this lecture format um, video of the celestial sphere, but it is absolutely not our last chance to practice with these topics. We will definitely have other activities, other animations to watch, worksheets to go through um, that will help build our understanding. I do list some supplemental workbooks that are often used in introductory astronomy and the relevant um, pages that would be useful in this section. And we'll be talking about what activities our particular course will use this semester um, outside of this lecture format. So the next time we see each other, we will be in a brand new section of chapter two. And so I will see you then.